Good afternoon, everyone. And again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to um, share the slides that I have prepared um, for today's event. Um, I begin by uh, posing a very simple question. What other features have created a unique experience? Um, for those who flew in from abroad um, yesterday or last night, um, what were the criteria um, you had when you chose the airline of your choice? Um, was it something tangible, say like um, seat comfort or um, a good variety of um, in-flight um, entertainment, um, maybe exquisite cuisine, or simply maybe just um, dash the looks of flight cabin attendants. Um, that in turn, I think, is not. Um, well, maybe just we, we just leave it as tangible as long as the good looks not wear out. Um, or was it something um, um, tangible, something um, that's, that's more uh, emotional? Like, um, you like that airline brand because it sponsors your favorite soccer team. Um, or maybe, again, it's just dashing good looks. The thing is, you know what it is, because it was your choice, but I do not know it. Um, as um, some academics very painfully put it, um, quality in airline service is difficult to describe in many due to its heterogeneity, tangibility, and inseparability. And only the customer. <coughs> and truly combine service quality. And that was in 1992. And since then, um, academics and airlines have tried to um, measure, to, to quantify and evaluate airline service quality. Um, today we have things like um, uh, marketing tools, um, big data analytics, social listening, and lots of kinds of tools to help us achieve that end. Um, there are also um, diagnostic models such as one I put up um, here um, that are often used to evaluate um, customer expectations and perceptions. Um, you could, for example, try to measure um, service quality of tangibles by looking into things like um, up to date technology, um, appealing um, physical features. Um, IFE, or you can try to uh, evaluate responsiveness by looking at whether they prove our abilities, whether they are responsive, uh, whether they're efficiently willing to help, uh, look into reliability, on time performance, punctuality, whether they deliver a promise. Um, you can also look or evaluate assurance um, by seeing whether um, you have this feeling that you are in safe hands, and of course, you can also measure uh, empathy. And all these things you can measure um, to see if you really have the, the airline service quality and all these leads to um, satisfaction and to the way people perceive your service, service value as um, proposed to the perceived cost. And these um, influence behavioral intentions um, on whether or not to, to use that airline again on his or her next trip. Um, but then critics also argue about the adequacy of such uh, models or such approaches, and in many ways they're right. For example, do you have really all the full information of choice? Um, there may be some other factors that play an equally important role in the choice behavior. Um, things like um, price or booking issues like availability, um, number of connections, um, lines, and of flight program, and things like that. Um, but having said that, these um, previous studies do to a certain extent to shed light on um, passengers' criteria for selecting airlines. For example, a survey um, in Kuala Lumpur Petitioner Airport of 500 passengers revealed that the most important criteria were reliability, uh, followed by tangibility and um, another uh, study in Hong Kong uh, surveyed 300 passengers and the study revealed significant differences in service expectations amongst passengers of different um, countries and different ethnic backgrounds. For example, US customers would place heavier emphasis on things like um, service reliability, 
things like comfort and flight protection, whilst um, um, foreign passengers generally regard reliability, assurance and risk factors as predictors of satisfaction. Hello. Oh, okay. So what indications can we draw from these um, studies? Um, so if service positively influences customer choice of airlines, then perhaps we should consider allocating resources from high performance, low importance dimension to high importance, low performance dimension, like what I've shown on the slide, which essentially is moving from the um, top left um, of the matrix to the um, bottom right. But then you still need to know what the high importance dimensions are to begin with. Um, it would be also, also good to consider um, segmenting customers who are more sensitive to service operation quality and have a strong preference for higher quality service products. And because um, expectations often come from previous experiences, it's also important to have consistency in customers' expectations and image and Right, um, being a Japanese airline, I thought I'd touch a little about um, Motenashi. Um, anyone here heard of the term Motenashi? Um, non Japanese, I'm asking. Let's see a show of hands. Okay. Um, no, it, it, it's not Italian, it's not um, Motenashi, uh, uh, which means persevering man in Italian. No, it's not that. It is a tomate mashi, which um, is often loosely translated as a Japanese style of hospitality. So, how is tomate mashi different from um, hospitality? Um, a study by um, Nagawa and Manuro have been trying to um, quantify the value of tomate mashi. They identified the five features of tomate mashi and grouped them into 12. And it is said to be different from Western style um, hospitality in that it requires um, maintaining a certain distance with the customer um, and yet being able to, to sense his or her needs and to be able to, to make judgment and decisions on what would be the most appropriate next action to do. Um, and you can't find this in, in manuals, uh, you can't depend on manuals to do that um, because manuals by nature are incomplete, just as contracts are. But you can't um, write, you can't include all the things you can think of that could arise. Um, so unlike manual-based um, service delivery, Omotenashi requires discretion and um, emotional as well as cultural intelligence. Um, which is why in Japan Airlines, in our cabin crew training, we place heavy emphasis on cultivating the service mind. First, before going into the technical part of cabin crew service training or skill training. Um, so for the past couple of minutes I've been talking about um, evaluating and quantifying uh, airline service. Um, but um, I, I think well, in Japan airlines for example we, we, um, we have customer surveys, we do focus group interviews. Um, to understand um, customers' key buying factors as well as the perception of the airline so that we could, um, um, we could configure our product and services to better serve the needs. Um, but I'd just like to highlight three points. But I think it all boils down really to, to in, in order to create um, a unique experience is to, to look into details and three areas like to share one in, in product and service concept. And our idea is to deliver to our customers a one class of experience. So if you are when we are developing a product for economy class, we have to buy business class, when we are developing a product for business class, we have to buy first class. And for having crew, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, we place heavy emphasis on creating not just the basic value, but also on uh, impressive value. And in terms of product and service, um, development process itself, we place 
can be emphasized by details, details, and details. So things like, so if we, if we talk about the you know, chair we have on the flight, um, if we look into safety compliance, design quality, competitiveness, um, supply confidence, cost, and facility value, um, ROI, usability, and uh, piece of maintenance, space efficiency, and this can go on as far as creating the best economy class seats because when you come to think of it, um, economy class carries the most number of passengers to find. So they, they did things like, um, in order to create extra knee room, they did trimmed off three centimeters off um, the seat in the front. But the curve part you can see on the right slide, uh, just as, so as to create extra room space. Um, other features we have created like the 42 inch wide seat, seat beach on our um, new room economy. Um, as I mentioned, um, we would like to invite everyone to experience our one class of service on the new business class suite. Um, the bed is long and wide and it's not this second layout where you have to um, stick your legs when you go to bed into the, the seat in front of you or I should say between the seat in front of you or, or a petition on the side but you just stretch out and, and um, use the previous office facility and we have we provide air weave um, mattress and pillows used by top athletes um, to ensure that we get quality sleep and all of these seats have access to aisles. Um, the first class is essentially your private study or your company bedroom plus a large and three inch monitor and many other features. Um, last um, but not least of all is fine cuisine. Um, Japan's Washoku is a UNESCO listed um, intangible cultural heritage and in um, Tokyo we boast having the most number of Michelin star restaurants um, a total of 267 if I remember correctly and we collaborate with these top chefs um, to produce and deliver restaurant quality food um, in, in our flights so everything from the material, the ingredients, um, the spice, the body, the procedures, they are all specified by these um, top chefs that we apply by those specifications in order to create um, a, a very good dining experience on board the flight. Um, and the only way to know that I'm not making all this stuff is for you yourselves to, to try and experience for yourselves on our product and services. So I look forward to working with you on board Japan Airlines. Thank you.